Welcome to God at Work, Stories of Grace and Faith. I'm your host, Chuck Groover. And well, this month, for the story about past Christians, I figured I would pretty much just talk about probably one person that doesn't really come to mind when thinking about famous names in Christianity. Although, he is a fairly famous name. And the person I'm talking about is... J.R.R. R. Tolkien. Tolkien was born John Ronald Reuel Tolkien on January 3rd, 1892 and died September 2nd, 1973. And basically, pretty much to his family, he was known as, he was known by Ronald. He was an English writer poet, philologist, and a university professor, and we pretty much best know him for his works, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. He was born in Bloemfontein in the Orange Free State, which is now basically Free State Province in South Africa to parents Arthur Rule Tolkien and Mabel. He had one uh, sibling, a younger brother named Hilary Arthur Rule Tolkien, and it said that while living in South Africa as a child, Tolkien was actually bitten by a baboon, baboon spider, which some people think that this event was later echoed in his stories. I mean, when hearing about this, what comes to my mind is the encounter with the spiders both in The Hobbit with Bilbo and the dwarves being captured by the spiders, but also in The Lord of the Rings where Frodo has to deal with a giant spider. But Tolkien actually stated that he didn't really have any memory, such memory of that event happening in his life. And really he doesn't have much recollection of his life in South Africa because when he was three years old, Tolkien along with his mother and brother, went, to e went from South Africa to England. And it was while there that his father actually died of rheumatic fever while still in South, South Africa. He was going to later join them on their trip, but was unable to because of dying. And this pretty much left the family with no income. But with both Tolkien's parents originally being from England, they actually ended up in, in South Africa due to better job prospects in banking for his father. Tolkien's mother basically took him to live with her parents in Birmingham. And then in 1896, they eventually moved to Sarah Hole which is now in, located in Hall Green. And it was while living in this area that he explored like places like Sarah Hole Mill, uh, Mosley Bod, Clint, Likey, and Malvern Hills, which all of these places actually inspired scenes within his books, along with a lot of the nearby towns and villages, including his Aunt Jane's farm, which is known by a name that many people will recognize the name from some of his stories, specifically The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, as the name of his aunt's farm was Bag End. And as a child, basically Tolkien was a very... I guess a voracious learner, 
he, by the age of four, it was said he was able to read, and his mother actually allowed him to read very many, a lot of different books. Um, it was said that he, that books such as like Treasure Island and The Pied Piper were books that he just disliked. And then, I guess, some thoughts he expressed regarding Alice's adventure in Wonderland was that it was amusing but disturbing. And some of the stories that he actually enjoyed and reading in, were those that included uh, what he called Red Indians, which are the Native Americans, but also the fantasy works of George MacDonald, as well as the fairy books of Andrew Lang, which if, you, if you're familiar with Tolkien's writings, which many people are, especially with in the last 20 years, The Lord of the Rings being done as a film series and The Hobbit being made into like four or five movies itself, you know that basically fantasy and fairy books would pretty much have had an influence on his writings. And as someone who has an interest in fiction and writing myself, yeah, the type of stories that interest you are probably going to be more likely the type that really, that you end up writing. I mean, I, I like science fiction, and some of the thoughts of stories I have lean more towards that science fiction space opera type concept. In 1900, uh, Mabel Tolkien was received into the Roman Catholic Church, uh, despite the, pro the protests of her, ba her Baptist family, and actually, this move pretty much separated her and, as well as Tolkien and his brother, from both sides of the family. This stopped all financial assistance that she was receiving from her parents and her side of the family to help raise the kids. And eventually in 1904, she actually died of acute diabetes, which at the age she was, it pretty much was the age at which at that time, if someone had type 1 diabetes, which is insulin dependent, that people would die because at that time they didn't have insulin to treat diabetes. And actually nine years later, Tolkien actually had this to say about his, his uh, mother. It was, My own dear mother was a martyr indeed, and it is not to everybody that God grants so easy a way to his great gifts as he did to Hillary and myself giving us a mother who killed herself with labor and trouble to ensure us keeping the faith. So, a lot of her faith pretty much was, and her actions were what helped keep Tolkien and his brother actually in the faith. And before and really, before she died, she actually assigned guardianship of Tolkien and his brother to her close friend, uh, Father Francis Xavier Morgan, who basically was assigned to bring them up as good Catholics. And which he was a job he took seriously, um, which we'll later get into some conflict between Tolkien and him, somewhat because of his role, but also, and also at a young age, 
Tolkien was, show, was showing remarkable linguistic gifts. So not only was he reading at the age of four, but again, at a young age, he had mastered Latin and Greek, which at that time were a staple of any type of arts education. And he was actually becoming competent in a number of other languages, both ancient and relatively modern. Uh, specifically the Germanic languages. It was while in his early teens that Tolkien actually encountered constructed languages. And the first being animal, animalic, which was an invention of his cousins Mary and Marjorie, uh, Inquidon, their interests in it soon died, though. However, Mary, along with some others, including Tolkien, invented a new and more complex language called Nevbosh. And after that, pretty much the next constructed language that Tolkien came to work with was Nafarin, which was actually one of, one of his own creation. In 1911, Tolkien actually began uh, studying at Ex Exeter College in Oxford. And he initially started out studying, the cla studying classics, but then he later changed his course of study to English language and literature in 1913, upon which he then graduated from that course with, uh, with first class honors in 1915. And it was during this period that at the age of 16, Tolkien actually met Edith Mary Bratt, who was a, actually a woman three years his senior. And this pretty much sparked a love affair as the two really hit it off and it was clear to pretty much any everyone around them that they were interested in each other and it was pretty much a love affair that displeased father morgan who and this was because edith was not only an older woman but she was a protestant and he also viewed her as being the reason that Tolkien had pretty much muffed his exams. So pretty much Father Morgan prohibited Tolkien from actually meeting, talking to, or even corresponding with her in any way until Tolkien reached the age of 21. And to an extent, Tolkien pretty much obeyed this prohibition to the letter with one early exception to which Father Morgan then threatened Tolkien that if he didn't cut his, basically if he didn't cut ties with Edith until he was 21, his university career would be cut short. And... On, Tol on the Wikipedia page about Tolkien, there's actually, a, they actually quoted, I guess, a letter or a point where Tolkien had mentioned to someone his th thoughts regarding this, how he was at conflict because Father Morgan was not just a Roman Catholic priest or whatever his position was in the Roman Catholic Church, but he was an actual father figure to both Tolkien and his brother. And he actually said he was more of a father figure than many fathers were to their own kids. And, but he was conflicted between obeying his father and pretty much obeying his heart. And he eventually settled on obeying his father and if it was meant to be, Edith would still be there when he's turned 21. If not, it wasn't meant to be, basically, is what he said. 
So on the evening of his 21st birthday, Tolkien eventually wrote Edith, who at the time was actually living in Cheltenham with a family friend, C.H. Uh, Jessup. In the letter, basically Tolkien explained that he had never stopped loving her and actually asked her to marry him. The only issue was, by this point, Edith had actually accepted a marriage proposal from George Field, who was the brother of one of her close school friends. And this was because she felt like she was on the shelf and actually start, had started to doubt that Tolkien actually had cared for her. But upon re receiving Tolkien's letter, she actually realized, basically, it was Tolkien's letter that changed everything. So then, on January 8th of 1913, Tolkien actually traveled to Cheltenham and was met at the station by Edith, because he, tra he traveled by train, where the two of them took a walk into the countryside and talked and everything. And pretty much by the end of the day, Edith accepted Tolkien's proposal. And the result of this was George Field himself was pretty much dreadfully upset at first, and his family was insulted and angry. And this was when they found out when Edith, by Edith writing him and actually returning the engagement ring. And when Jessup basically wrote to Edith's guardians, because pretty much like Tolkien and his brother, she was pretty much orphaned when she was a child and was left under the guardianship of someone. And Jessup basically wrote to them saying he couldn't really see anything wrong with Tolkien except for the fact that he really had no job prospects or anything like that. And Tolkien and Edith were formally engaged in January of 1913, and after which uh, Edith re reluctantly announced that she was converting to Catholicism at Tolkien's insistence, which resulted in Jessup basically kicking her out of his place. And they were eventually married on March 22nd, 1916 at St. Mary Immaculate Roman Catholic Church in Warwick. And Tol Tolkien later expressed admiration for Edith's willingness to actually marry a man with no job and no prospects except for being killed in the Great War. Because as we'll see, in August of 1914, the United Kingdom actually entered into the First World War. And actually, Tolkien's relatives were shocked that he did not enlist Im immediately because at this time, pretty much young men who are of age were actually enlisting. And those that didn't join up immediately were pretty much scorned publicly. But instead, Tolkien rather entered a program that pretty much allowed him to finish his degree before he enlisted. And then on June 2nd of 1916, he actually re received a telegram sum summoning him to Folkestone for posting to France. And if you remember from what I mentioned early, earlier, he had only mar gotten married just a couple months earlier, and this, and he was basically enlisted as a lieutenant, and at this point in time in the war, a lot of the junior officers were coming back in boxes. So, he pretty much stated that his leaving his 
new wife was pretty much like a death in itself. I mean, kind of it reminds me of a song by a group called Plank Eye called Goodbye, where, there's, where it ends with the line saying, sometimes death takes many forms, even while alive. Um, and it was, and on his transit to France, basically to a place called Calais, um, af it was after that, at, during a time of boredom, that Tolkien actually wrote the poem, The Lonely Isle, which was inspired by his feelings while in transit to his posting in France. And then on October 27th of 1916, as his battalion attacked uh, Regina Trench, he actually came down with trench fever and a couple weeks later was actually sent back to England on November 8th. And the thing is, is in this point in the war, many of his close friends were killed. Actually, throughout the war, many of his close friends were killed. He had a group of friends from when he was in school that formed a little club that would drink tea and everything and converse and pretty much it was mentioned that pretty much all but one of them other than Tolkien or pretty much all of them that had died in some form or fashion during through the war and to be honest if it wasn't for Tolkien suff suffering health problems which had caused him to be removed from combat on numerous occasions. He himself might have actually been killed in the First World War. So, we have health problems to be thankful for, for having pretty much the literary great of Tolkien, but for other things as well, which we'll see later, but actually in a later recounting when he was talking about people looking for parallels with his work and actually the Second World War he had mentioned that pretty much by 1918 at the end of the war all but one of his actual close friends had died in the war and after being sent back to England, Tol Tolkien actually spent the rest of the war on the home front, alternating between hospitals and garrison duties, as he was actually deemed medically unfit for general, general duties, or, which I guess meant he was unfit to be sent back to the front lines. So he pretty much spent the rest of his time back in England. And then by November 3rd, 1920, Tolkien was actually demobilized and left the army with rank of lieutenant. Uh, his first job after leaving the army was actually working for the Oxford English Dictionary where he dealt with the history and etymology of words of Germanic origin that began with the letter W. I'm not sure how thrilling of a job that was, but being someone who was in, interested in linguistics and everything, and reading of some of his history, I'm sure he probably actually enjoyed it. <laughs> but then he later took up post at the University of Leeds as a reader in English language and, act and actually became the youngest professor there. He then, from there, returned to Oxford as a Rawlinson and Bosworth professor of Anglo-Saxon, 
with a fellowship at Pembroke College. And then in 1945, he actually moved on to Merton College, Oxford, becoming the Merton Professor of English Language and Literature, which is actually the, the position he held until his retirement in 1959. And during his professional career, out after uh, the First World War, although he was asked to join up during the Second World War as pretty much a cryptographer, basically, or, but was never, but eventually his, he was told his services weren't needed, but some of his works during his time as pretty much a professor and everything included translations of the story of Sir G uh, Gawain, uh, the story of Beowulf, um, an interesting thing that I saw, and it actually has me wanting to read uh, that, specifically this book, in, is he translated the book of Jonah for the Jerusalem Bible, which was published in 1966. So I just would like to see what his translation of the book of Jonah, how that reads. Uh, he also wrote uh, to his kids every Christmas, pretty much little Christmas stories uh, that every year he would add like new characters to it. And I'll, I'll include a link to the, t I can't remember the title, I didn't write it down in my notes, but I'll include a link to the to the Amazon listing for the book because it sounds like an, it would be an interesting book to read at least every Christmas. I know my sister reads The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus every every year as kind of a, her own tradition. I read a, I read that once. It was okay, but I'm thinking this might be something more my speed. Uh, and but pretty much he. As mentioned, he retired in 1959, and pretty much during his retirement, he actually received increasing public attention and fame. And in 1961, uh, his friend C.S. Lewis actually had nominated him for the Nobel, Nobel Prize in Literature. And he, pretty much due, the, due to the popularity of his books in the with the 1960s countercultural movement, he actually started to become quite unhappy to the point where he became deplored at becoming a cult figure to these people. And it was actually due to fan attention that he had his, eventually had his phone number removed from the public directory and him and his wife moved to Bournemouth, which is where in November of 1971 his wife died. Um, and then 21 months later, he died. And after his wife died on her tombstone, he actually had the name Luthien engraved right underneath her name. And after he was buried in the same plot, he had to his name added Baron, which were two figures prominent in kind of the legend and mythology of of basically the Middle Earth, the world that he had created. Um, going back into his work, specifically Lord of the Rings, many commentators have actually remarked about the potential parallels between pretty much the Middle Earth saga and the events that took place within Tolkien's lifetime, such as England during and after uh, the Second World War being represented in The Lord of the Rings, with a lot of the industrialization stuff going on at the time, and Tolkien being, I guess, big against a lot of that. But actually, Tolkien rejected that opinion both 
in the second edition of The Lord of the Rings, but as well as an essay he wrote on fairy stories. Um, as mentioned, to uh, Tolkien was a devout Catholic, and in which his beliefs in the fundamental truths of Christianity actually led many commentators to find uh, Christian themes within the Lord of the Rings as well. And one thing about that is Tolkien himself actually acknowledged that while originally he didn't intend he didn't intend for it to be on first writing, but then going back through it again, he did decide to do that to do this. He said that it was a fundamentally religious and Catholic work. And a lot of it can be seen with his basically orthodox with the orthodox view of Christ, Christian view of evil being pretty much how he presents evil within his book or the books for the Lord of the Rings. Um, it was also the Catholic theology and imagery which played a part pretty much in fashioning a lot of Tolkien's creative imagination. But it wasn't just his works that his devout Catholic faith had an effect on. It actually served as a significant factor in the, con the conversion of C.S. Lewis to Christianity from atheism. And it was pretty, that's, and this right here is pretty much the main reason why I decided to focus on Tolkien. Is, yeah, we don't view him as being a famous person within Christianity, but God used him pretty much to bring one of the more modern, one of the big names, and I'd probably say in modern Christian theology, to, to faith. I mean, if it wasn't for Tolkien, we probably wouldn't have C.S. Lewis. But Tolkien was kind of dismayed that Lewis had actually joined the Church of England instead of the Catholic Church, and he also objected strongly to Lewis's use of religious references in his stories, which were overtly, often overtly allegorical. So, Tolkien is probably of the mindset where a lot of, and kind of how I would be as when I start if I start focusing on doing some writing, more of, I don't want to be, not wanting to be pigeonholed as, known as a Christian author, writing basically even just Christian fiction, but using the Christian worldview as helping to shape and influence his writing, where C.S. Lewis was more of the type Everything is clearly Christian, and basically to where I know I've heard of people that were like, yeah, I started reading the Chronicles of Narnia, and then I realized they were Christian, so I stopped reading them. And it's one of those things, some creatives will lean the one way to focus on pretty much the catering to the Christian crowd. Other creatives, like Tolkien, will allow their faith to influence their work, but not define their work, I guess is what I'd be getting at. And it was, this was just kind of one thing that I guess Tolkien and Lewis, besides a denomination, just didn't quite come eye to eye on. But, and as I said, while, like, while this isn't like most of my stories about the famous Christians or events, as I, as I said, Tolkien wasn't especially known for his Christianity, and you can, but it's important for, for us to see how you don't have to be a, a big name in Christianity. You don't have to be 
a pastor, you don't have to be a theologian, a professor at a Christian university, a Christian teacher, a, a Christian author, musician. You can be pretty much technically, I would say, an everyday person or someone who's not specifically known for their Christian faith, yet still be a Christian, and God can still use you. I mean, as I said, he used a writer from humble beginnings to lead probably one of the biggest names in modern Christianity to the Lord. So if you're ever thinking that just because you're not a theologian, you don't have a seminary degree, you, have, you barely understand the Bible when you read it, you have a hard time understanding the King James English, your favorite translation is actually the paraphrase, the message, God can still use you. As long as you're open to being used by God. So, as I leave you this week, this is Chuck Groover. That was J.R.R. Tolkien. And that's God at Work. <laughs>